So we'll just banter for a minute. All right. We got, uh, let's see, make sure, let me switch over real quick. I think we're live though. We are rocking. Hey everyone. We're back. Yes. It's, doesn't it feel good? It feels good to be back. Feels right? good to be back. Last week was a little bit of a cluster with uh, our internet crashing. Uh, still yeah. don't know what ever happened with that. Uh, yeah, who'd you talk to on uh, the phone for like two hours? Spencer or something? Uh, Trey, I think Trey. It was. I don't know. If you're listening, Trey. Thanks for your help, man. Thanks, but we didn't really get anywhere. Didn't get so anywhere. welcome live from the, new, the, uh, the Northern Angler uh, in front of a studio audience of just Storm. So... Right? Uh, no one here, of course. We're no doing these the uh, fly, fly tyings. We've been doing them since December, I think we found out the yes. other day. I mean, yep. And we are super, super stoked for tonight. Um, I have one of my dear friends, Tom Larimer from the West Coast. A lot of you know him. He's he's a big deal in the industry, man. Spay but guru. Uh, I mean. Fly tire. All around um, kind of cool fly dude, Fly designer, man. great dude, you know, sales manager for... Uh, G. Loomis, G. Loomis currently, yeah, so, he's been a lot of things. So and and anyway, we're lucky great to guy. have, we have big, a lot of history big together. Get. So we'll bring Tom on right now. But uh, if you're if you're new to the channel, think about hitting the subscribe button. And if you want to interact with Tom, if you want to push some questions our way and to Tom's way, use that chat window down below. Uh, we'll pop the questions up on the screen, and absolutely, uh, you can pick the brain of Tom Larimer. I mean, what a cool opportunity this is! So, absolutely, we're let's super bring excited. Tom right on screen right now. There he is. Welcome, Tom. Hey guys, <laughs> what's up, buddy? Good to be. How are you? Uh, we're busy. We're doing great, man. We're a little fried. It's, nice it's... to be in Northern Michigan again, <laughs> <laughs> even if it is virtually, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, uh, I, you know, it's been, my gosh, I think I moved out west in 2002. And so it's been a long time since you and I guided together uh, on the Manistee and the Pier Marquette and some of the other rivers around there. But um, I still really miss, uh, I miss being on those rivers. I miss fishing with you, Pitts. Thanks, and, buddy. Uh, Likewise. Know, when, when the world gets back to some version of normal here, I'm going to make a point to get back up there because it's been too long. It has been too long, and, and I'm still cursed from the last time we fished together in New Orleans, and I had to buy that <laughs> voodoo doll for Lily. Oh, I forgot about so, that. I remember uh, that. Gosh, you know I, that. It, I <laughs> that. remember telling you specifically not to screw with voodoo. You did. You said, don't mess with the voodoo, and I said, I don't believe in that. And, and now I'm like 0 for 6 on permit. So the saltwater <laughs> voodoo doll carries forth. <laughs> we have to do it's something. Neither. What do you think, What do you get to counteract the might, voodoo doll? You and I might be two of the most superstitious people that I've ever met. Uh, we, in might the world. we might yeah. be. We might be. The bananas, there's, there's the white lighter. Every... Yeah. yeah. The bananas, white lighter. Don't change your clothes. Don't change your hat. I mean, I can remember you coming over to the house and and doing laundry. And you're like, I haven't washed this for two weeks because I've been <laughs> catching fish. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, yeah. So, so funny. I remember, uh, I remember a, a case of waiter rash that you had, which we are not oh, going to go into. No. Here, uh, they, oh, you know, it comes. One it, word. Does it come back all the time? It, it, it turns out that every year for Christmas, I get a, uh, a jar of monkey butt powder. <laughs> <laughs> what? It was so bad. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. Well, Brian, one of the things I uh, I remember very distinctly, um, I came over to your house with uh, the, the the woman that I was dating at the time and your uh, wife at the time, and uh, we cooked dinner together. And, and I think you, you had been on the river for about as long as I had, or maybe it was vice versa, but I remember it was something like... 46 days in a row sure and it was funny because we were sitting on your deck kind of just you and i at one point and it was the literally the first day we'd had off in like 40 some days right and you looked at me and you said god i miss it <laughs> <laughs> you know the funny and i just thought that was awesome i mean i think that it was a really fun time for uh we had a great crew of guides that we worked with uh you know jay niederstadt bob clark uh, Billy Boynton, uh, right. you know, there was Larry Rainey. Uh, there was yep. some really, really ta good talent there. And it was a cool, 
I think it was a really cool uh, environment for us because we were all uh, trying new things and challenging each other and sharing information. And through that, I mean, I think a lot of us had uh, a lot of influence on each other in our fly design. Absolutely. And uh, I did not find the Dorito bag shrimp, by the way. I I did find, and so this was, the Dorito bag shrimp was a fly that, I don't even remember what happened. I'm assuming there was way too many beers involved. Um, but I did find this, which is pretty cool. This is a, a fly box that uh, when Brian and I worked together at uh, Schmidt Outfitters. Uh, can you guys see that okay on the screen? We can, yes. And yeah, and this, this wood was milled from a log that came out of, I believe, the pine or the manistee. I'm not it sure. Was, it was the manistee. Uh, and the shop had these made, and they're numbered. It's pretty cool. And so... This is actually um, some of the flies that I used to swing. Here, I got to go that way. Uh, <laughs> back in the Great Lakes on the Manistee, and and uh, and I think you know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a cool lead into tying flies. Like back then, you know, this was before Skagit heads. This is before T14, all that good stuff, right? So we used my to make our own was lines. Kind of going buggy. And, and I certainly caught fish on those, right? As I'm sure you guys have caught stuff on really small buggy stuff. But um, we, weren't, we weren't there yet when I was guiding there, even though I was really trying to figure it out. And uh, a lot of people paved the way before that. But hopefully some of the stuff I'm going to tie tonight uh, has been influenced a lot by uh, kind of the Great Lakes. I mean, it's really interesting um, just – Jay Niederstadt, who was one of our close friends who we guided together, he and I were talking about this the other day, how, you know, really kind of uh, the flash thing that you guys have done in the Great Lakes really inspired me to start trying flash. And then Scott Powell and I had a conversation and I told him, hey, man, like I'm using a ton of flash. He goes, well, how much? I go, you can't use too much. And then the prom dress came about. Uh, and I had a kind of a version of that, and uh, and just just recently I saw a new pattern come out that came out that was really very much inspired by Scott's flies. So I think it's kind of cool how you know we're all building on one another's time, right? Uh, right. And and it's it all kind of started there for me, uh, but also how the Great Lakes have influenced flies even the West Coast and vice versa, right? Sure. Sure. Those were some special times, and that's for sure. Um, gosh, you know, I think the Dorito bag came about when you were at the Trabin. Yeah. And you yeah. would sit down and play guitar. Uh, I hope you still play because you were a wonderful guitarist. But Tom lived behind this bar in this trailer that had a roof over it. And that's a really common thing in northern Michigan because the double, the single white trailers don't yeah. have the snow load, so they put a roof over it, and we called it the Trabin. And yeah. I can remember you coming up with that. And I'll never forget, like, dude, I caught a fish at Grassy Bank the next day on that. Like, you know, first thing in the morning, I'm like, dude, that fly works. It's so great, Tom. You know, way to go. And then we tied up all these Dorito bag flies. And, you know, of course, Ray looked at us like, you guys are insane. You know, like, seriously, dude. Like, Well, you had to use the white from the logo. That was, like, the right. key thing. But it had to still have yeah. a little bit of blue in it, I remember. Because you're like, Brian, you got to put some blue in there. Little little speck of blue in there. Yeah. It was the Cool Ranch. Tree. It was the Cool Ranch. It was the Cool yeah. Ranch flavor. I brought a lighter in the other day from my car, and I set it on the counter. And my wife's like, "What does this say? Does it say no white?" And on the other side, lighters. And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I don't. I don't know. Brian like took it from me and sharpied on it, and he said, absolutely not. Get that out of the shop.'" Yeah, no white light. I was like, I don't know. I don't get it. But <laughs> We were very superstitious back in the day. Yeah, still am. Still am. Yep, me too. So what are we tying tonight, Tom? Uh, well, I'm going to tie a couple of flies. Uh, I'm going to tie a, a pattern that was very much Great Lakes inspired um, called the tube leech. I'm going to do that second. Uh, but I thought I would tie uh, a reverse marabou. This is... One of the patterns that I think, I mean, though, between those two patterns, I mean, it's kind of funny. I, I was looking through my steelhead stuff and literally like this is what I carry when I go steelhead fishing. There's Maxima hooks and some flies in there and some random other crap. But both of the flies or all of the flies that I fish now are typically these two flies. 
and variations of those flies. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit before we kind of start tying though, a little bit about just fly design and sort of what I think about and what I think is important in a fly. And so uh, specifically, we're talking about kind of sink tip flies, stuff that you would use uh, in the Great Lakes uh, area, whether it's in you know Northern Michigan, uh, over in Wisconsin, where I grew up and guided when I was younger, uh, you know, places like the Salmon River way out east and, uh, you know, the Ohio fisheries. So um, for me, I kind of think about, you know, with sink tip flies, number one, uh, they have to sink fast. And one of the things that's happened out here on the West Coast is that, you know, people end up putting a lot of crap on flies. <laughs> and all that really does is slow the sink rate down. And so you want to have a fly that drops quickly through the water column and gets to where you want it to go very, very quickly. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. Movement is incredibly important. Uh, specifically, too, within the fly, it's hard to make a fly, you know, like I was watching your guys' video with Gunner, uh, and that guy is such a sick tire. Holy moly. He's um, really good. But, you know, kind of watching his tying style and the, the fly that he was tying, that, that kind of tube jig style fly, you know, that fly is meant to juke. It's doesn't. It's hard to make flies do that on a swing. So you need to build movement into, you know, into the actual fly. Um, I like my flies to push some water. I mean, that's, you know, there's a reason the muddler minnow has been around for as long as it, as it has. Uh, but that's a tricky thing to balance between pushing water and getting it to, to sink fast. Uh, and then from a guide standpoint, I was always concerned about being, you know, really easy to cast. Uh, because if you can't get the fly out to the fish, you, you're not going to catch anything. Um, I'm reading off a couple notes. Durability, really, really uh, an important thing. And then adaptable to conditions, which uh, I'll show you some versions of this fly and how I rig it uh, afterwards. Um, and then, of course, I mean, I think aesthetics are really important, right? Like, it's it's nice to see a pretty fly hanging out of a steelhead's face, right? So absolutely there's all this balancing act between that kind of functionality of the fly and making it like something that's really beautiful and pretty uh but not distracting from the actual fishability of it right and so pretty much all of the flies i fish for steelhead on sink tips are tubes and i'll just go in really quickly to some of the reasons that i really like tubes the the biggest one is that i feel like you simply land more fish and steelheaders are kind of funny. We're funny animals, especially swing guys. Like, we count like the maybes, right? We're like, ooh, ooh, yes. I had, a, I, had a, I had, I had, a, like, a pluck. How'd you do today? I got a pluck, and you're like, oh, fucking right on. Uh, sorry, is this supposed to be G rated? <laughs> no, it's fine. No. <laughs> so uh, you know, I got a pull. Oh, I got a grab. Oh, I hooked one, right? But yeah, bump. There's this big, big difference between getting a fish to engage your fly and then actually putting it in the net. And this is something that steelheaders simply don't pay enough attention to. So, uh, you know, on a tube fly, when it's rigged, uh, I've got a rigged one here, the way we are rigging this, and I'll show you guys some more versions of this, maybe a little bit later, but effectively the tube is just riding on the leader. Can you guys see that? Okay. Yeah. We so can I've see got it a, pretty well. I've got a loop of line and then I've got a hook. And that loop is about an inch long. And so the hook is threaded on there so that when that fly, I've got two flies stacked here, but um, just to be simplistic. So that fly is back in the rear end of the fly, not necessarily all the way back, but it's independent of the fly. And so when a fish is torquing on this thing, you know, number one, they have no leverage, right? So even with a shank fly, they have some leverage. And especially what I started to notice was when you had lead eyes on a shank, it was really easy to lose uh, to lose fish on that. Um, so the, they just stay pinned way, way better. So I think that's that's one thing. I love the versatility of these. I can rig this unweighted as it is. I can stack a fly in front of it and get a bigger profile. So now I've got two, two flies. And then I have different oh, ways wow. to rig weight. This is just a a uh, fly tying cone lined with a, a tube on the inside. And we do what's called a, uh, what's called a bobber stop knot or a uni knot. Um, and it's just a, uh, like a three or four turn uni knot. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but it's just an independent piece of line 
that we basically tied a little knot to act as a stopper. So now you've got a, a big profile fly, you've got a weighted fly, and uh, you know, and it's simple, right? So it's kind of a system. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very cool it's modular. System, what hook do you Super use on that? Modular. Yeah, and then the other cool thing is, you know, in the Great Lakes, typically the rivers are slower, so fishing like a size four hook is better because it'll stay up in the fly. Whereas if you have like a, a heavier hook, like a two or a one, something you might fish out west on a big, you know, heavy river, um, that would hang down, right? So size of fish, if you're going to the Bulkley, you're probably going to be fishing a one. Uh, if you're fishing on the Deschutes, you're probably going to be fishing a two. And if I was going to the Manistee, I'd be fishing a four, right? Right. So I don't have yeah. to have different flies for different hooks. Um, everybody always asks, what, what hook do you prefer? Uh, I, I really like an owner SSW or those, those Daiichi uh, intruder hooks work really well as well. Um, but it's just an up eye octopus hook. So those work really well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th those are kind of, you know, some of the functionality. And, and then the other thing is they're just easy to transport, right? Like I can just huck them in a bag and they're not getting all tangled and they're just easy. So it's kind of my system. I wear, you know, a pair of waders. I've got the, you know, the, the flap on the front that has the mesh on the back and I just dry my tubes in there and they don't get tangled and it's, it's a great system. So that's, that's really why I fish tubes. So why don't we, why don't we tie one? Let's do it. Let's tie a fly. All Absolutely. Right. So again, yeah, uh, everybody keep using that chat window. If you have questions, we'll kind of interject them as Tom is tying, but we're just going to kind of hand it over to him and let him have the reins here. All righty. And we got, uh, we got, I was screwed Dave's name up. Pinchkowski. Dave Pinchkowski's watching uh, yeah. too. He said, hey, bud. Yeah. So... Dave That's cool. Pinchkowski has probably taught me more about steelheading than just about anybody. He's the man. He is the if man. If you ever get the chance to fish with him, he doesn't guide much anymore, but he's legendary. Yeah, yeah. All right, so <clears throat> so we're going to start off. This is a um, just a pro fisher. Uh, nope, that's a hook guide. Um, uh, it's the micro tube. Um, which camera are we on, Matt? Uh, we're still on split camera. Uh, I can switch over and we're going to go down to the... Uh, tire only. Tire only so that uh, we're tight on your vice right now. Yep. So why don't you go ahead and switch and then I'll show Perfect. people what we're using. We're all switched and ready to rock. All right. So this is just the Pro Fisher. These are the, the micro tube. I, I just tie mostly on clear. They come in a lot of different colors. Uh, these guys have this little kind of molded, uh, you know, kind of rear area with like a little, almost like a nipple on it that effectively you would put one of these hook keepers onto the back. On this fly, I just get, simply just get rid of that and I just cut that guy off. Uh, and you guys will see why here in a minute. So <clears throat> the thing about this fly that you've got to kind of understand is you're basically tying it backwards to start with. And then you're going to flip the fly around on the vise to finish it. And so um, I'll show you kind of a finished version of it. And this is a really light, wispy one. Um, you know, kind of what I would fish for, for summer fish. And so you can see there's not a lot of material on this fly. And that's one of the big keys. The thing about this fly is this is a commercially tied marabou uh, that's probably in the water would be about the same size. But there's easily three times as much material on this fly versus this fly. And that's because we're going to be tying that material in a way where it's going to be working against the current, which will make sense here in a minute. So we are going to tie kind of a black and or, or olive and orange. This is a combination that um, works really well out here in the later fall. I've done well in the Great Lakes. Um, we can talk more about some colors um, later on here. But... Olive and orange, really, really, really good, especially in kind of clear water. So if you're new to fly tying or new to tube fly tying, you have to have a needle uh, to, to be able to accept your tube. And that's that's really, really key. So I'm uh, just using a six aught. Is that a six aught? Yeah, six aught in burnt orange. The thread is not really important. 
And so we're just going to start effectively in the middle of the tube and we're going to wrap forward. You just you want to leave a little room back here and you'll see why in a minute. So and I, I'm not going to go all the way to the front of the tube either because I, I want some room to work here because when I retie, uh, I don't want to be tied up. So stay fairly central in the tube and then just back off your thread, maybe a couple of millimeters right here. So we're going to start off with whatever the will be the front color on the fly. And we're, this one, we're going to start with uh, with olive. Admittedly, this is not the actual olive that I like to fish. This is like a dark olive. The olive that seems to work best for me is an olive brown by um, by hairline. But I don't have any really good ones. They're all picked through. So this is an olive, uh, just kind of a dark olive. And the thing to realize is that on the on the feather, there's a concave side and a convex side. So you can kind of see how the feather is kind of curling that way. So I like to face that towards me. And then I'm basically going to pick out this bottom fluff and then just dress the feather. And I really, when I'm selecting marabou guys, I, this is what's really, really important. You want to stay away from those shorter fiber, uh, you know, feathers that are all, they have a lot of fluff on them. Ideally, a little fluff is great. It's fine. But ideally, you've got your longest fibers um, that have, kind of the least amount of fluff. So that's a really good feather right there. So we effectively, we want probably no more than about five turns of marabou on this fly total. And just as a general rule of thumb, about a half of an inch of the feather is gonna equate to about one turn. So right about there is gonna give me one turn. So I'm gonna basically do about an inch, maybe just a just a little over a skosh. We are in the Midwest. I can say that. I say skosh out here. People don't know what the hell I'm Nobody talking knows. about. Did you get some so weird looks gonna... with that? <laughs> yeah. It's like door wall, so, right? Uh, I mean, we have our own little. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, when I, kind of a funny story when, um, you know, I grew up in Milwaukee and we had Time Bank, right? And so before ATMs were called ATMs, everyone called them time machines. And it was T-Y-M-E. I don't know if they're even in business anymore, right? But it, it was like, oh, you need some money. You go to the time machine, right? So when I moved out west, uh, you know, the first person I asked, I was like, hey, do you know where the time machine is? And they were like, they didn't have time banks. <laughs> <were> like, yeah. <laughs> All right, so basically, I'm trying to keep this in the frame here. So what I'm doing here, guys, is basically pinching the top of the feather and creating kind of a V. And it helps to kind of wet your fingers and just get some of the fibers stroked back. So like I said, I've got maybe just a little bit more than an inch here. And we're going to basically tie in right at that point. And again, the concave side is towards me. That's what's really important. So you're going to just tie into that V secure it you're going to be wrapping over this so it doesn't have to be pretty and then we're going to do a feather folding technique so you need to have your hackle pliers you're going to grab that and you really have to wet your fingers here and effectively what you're going to do is reach around the back of the feather and fold if you're right-handed the right side of the feather back on itself and then you're going to start wrapping and as you do this it's kind of easy to catch fibers in there so i i just kind of watch it if i start getting too many fibers caught i will kind of pick them out with a bodkin or whatever so that was about three turns and now we're going to tie that guy off now if you want to get really fancy and i do this from time to time i will add uh, like a collar of ostrich or rhea especially for like winter flies if i want a little bit bigger profile like here i've got one that's got some eh, some ostrich in it i don't know how well you can see that but it, it lengthens out the pattern a little bit this one it has a cone on the front as well um this would be the time that i would add any kind of coming to fish with pits on the rivers in northern michigan and to be honest i fish exactly this pretty much most of the time when i'm out west so we are gonna add just a little bit of, uh, this is Lady Amherst. And I like to take a feather kind of from 
kind of the middle here. You don't want this to be longer than your uh, your marabou. And we're going to do the same exact technique. Whoops, that one is just total crap. Hold on. See if I can find a good one. All right. So same deal here. You've got a concave side, convex side underneath. You're going to just strip away those bottom fibers. And then this, I only want maybe a turn, turn and a half on this. So I'm going to do the same technique where I'm just basically pulling that back. I'm going to go just a little bit more and create that V. And you can really see it on that feather, how you create that V, and that's going to be your tie point. So on the marabou, it's the exact same thing. And the reason I started putting this in the fly, and I, I really didn't originally, um, but it, it creates breakup in the fly. You know, when you look at like things like sculpins, things like bait fish, whatever, not, nothing is one color, right? They all have modeling, they all have scales, they have something that breaks up their silhouette. And so I started kind of playing with this in a lot of my flies. Um, and, it, and I do think it makes a difference. But again, you want, I mean, that was like one and a half turns, right? It's just enough to create a little bit of uh, that you know that feather has kind of striping on it so it's going to it's going to give some break up in the overall silhouette all right so now i'm going to add my second flavor of marabou if you were just doing a like a black and blue i would just do you know one one feather of, of black marabou and maybe do another turn or two so my ostrich let's see is that one better so these are both kind of sucky. I'm realizing my marabou population is uh, not awesome right now. So this one's pretty fluffy. I'm going to really strip it out and kind of, yeah, those are going to be pretty short. Let me see if this feather's any better. It's a little bit longer. And so this under color, I'm really going to be conservative with this. Uh, like I said, I don't want more than maybe five turns of total marabou. So this one I'm going to use a little bit less than the last color. And I, this color combination is so, it's so cool in the water because it looks very different than it does on the vise. It has a very much a kind of a crayfish sort of a look to it. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it works so well. So same technique, the feather folding technique, concave side towards me. I'm going to wet my fingers. I'm going to reach around back and I'm going to start wrapping and just keep folding those feathers with your, with your thumb and your index finger. And this is naturally going to be just a little bit shorter because it's a little further back in the fly. And I'm actually going to kind of cut that one a little short. Now, usually at this point, it, it pays to uh, kind of take your take a brush or a comb. I've got one of Pitzer's old toothbrushes here. I'm going to just comb it out. Get all get all the fibers in line. Is that clean Maybe enough? <laughs> all right. So this is looking pretty good. Um, the other thing I will tell you guys is when I'm securing this and I'm kind of wrapping back on itself, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, kind of use some pressure. I just realized, give me one sec, guys. I forgot to uh, plug in my phone and I've got my charger right here. Let me plug <laughs> just, it in. I was just wondering about that. <laughs> He just wants to, uh, we'll switch over real quick to uh, why he's doing that. I think Tom just wants to show off his brag wall of what, what do you got? Six, eight <laughs> pairs of waders there. You have some serious and, waders there, buddy. And if you look yeah. over Tom's left shoulder, I believe that's just a closet full of vests. Is that, is that <laughs> what that is, Tom? Is that uh? yeah. Yeah. That's the vest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, honestly, in, in all of my social media, this, uh, I, I did a post on this and it had one of the, probably one of the biggest engagements of of any post I've ever done. I had guys like asking me for plans and uh, it was it was pretty interesting. So I think I asked you for plans um, on that. You built that the first part of COVID. No, I built that like in the winter. Year. Yeah, in the winter, right? Yeah, built, in COVID I built a rod rack, I built two rod racks, uh, a chicken coop, 
a garden. I built all kinds of crap. So right, I remember you were picking up your tractor one day when I talked to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a little Kubota. It's awesome. <laughs> all right, are you back on the fly here, Matt? Yeah. All right. So I've got a kind of a weird. Okay, there we go. All right. So when I first started tying this fly, um, I, I oftentimes just put a piece of schloppen as kind of a shoulder. But the problem was when this fly would get wet and then it would end up in my pocket or my Ziploc bag or whatever, or after you fish it a couple of times, it would just look like a wet napkin in, in the water. And so I, I added this step uh, because it really helps the fly kind of puff back up and gives the fly a lot of body and that push we were talking about. So this is just a, a piece of, of rabbit strip this is kind of a crayfish orange, which is going to look awesome on this. And we're effectively going to clip this off the hide and uh, spin it into a dubbing loop. So it's really uh, good to have a dubbing loop spinner. Something that has some weight to it is really critical. And um, this is a, it's, if you tie steelhead flies, you need something to, to uh, spin dubbing loops. So I'm going to basically back my thread down the tube a little bit. And I'm going to create a loop with my finger that's maybe about four four inches long and then I'm going to back wrap and then I'm going to take my thread, my bobbin and wrap it around two times and that'll lock that loop in. Okay. So I'll back the thread off and I can go all the way to the back of the tube at this point. It doesn't matter. Then I'm going to take my, uh, my bobbin threader. It's got a little shepherd's crook on it. And what I like to do is to take a little bit of fly tying wax and just dab it. I, I don't want a lot on there. And I would tell you, you see how I'm using my fingers, my uh, my pinky and the next one over. I, if you get it on your fingers, the rabbit strip, if you get them on your uh, forefinger and thumb, the rabbit uh, will stick to it. So just to give that a nice little coat, coat of wax. And then we're going to take our rabbit strip. And what's critical here, guys, is not to use too much of this. So I'm going to grab this. And there's a little bit of a move here that really helps kind of separate it. So I'm going to cut about a half an inch. It's not going to seem like enough. And then just make one quick pull. If you do it slow, it seems like a lot of times you get kind of a bunch and it just doesn't come out perfect. So, but again, this is like sparse, just half an inch at most. You got to kind of judge it because different rabbit strips uh, are going to be thicker or thinner. Uh, but effectively, we just want a couple of turns. So, uh, what I did there, I kind of went through that kind of quick, but I just separated the loop with my fingers and I just captured the rabbit right in between. Now, at this point, you can kind of adjust the ends with your fingers if you need to um, and kind of get everything out of the way. Kind of a cool trick that a friend showed me, Mike Brown up at Mossy's Fly Shop in Anchorage. If you guys are ever up fishing Alaska, they're a great shop to go visit. So you get these little twist ties with fly lines, right? So save those things and then use that to kind of capture your marabou and keep it out of the way because it loves to jump in that loop. So now I've got my rabbit set. I'm going to just start spinning and I'm going to start slow and just kind of try to avoid any big bunching. And then once it starts to kind of spin like that, then I can start putting a little more speed on it. Now, from that point, before I go totally tight, I like to come in with a brush and just pick out a little bit and just kind of get it nice and fluffy and then give it a few more spins just to get it tight. And I'm going to grab that line with my hackle pliers and I'm effectively going to be just doing that same feather folding technique. So you have to wet your fingers for this. And basically, you're going to come right behind the... Uh, marabou and then just keep wrapping forward so i don't want more than maybe a turn and a half so i've got one turn that that should be about right and then i'm going to just tie that off and this is going to be a little out of control in the beginning you just kind of have to the rabbit likes to kind of fluff back on itself but i like to kind of back wrap on that rabbit to get it to kind of push forward you see that all right so now I'm going to take this guy off and just comb everything in. And you can now see it. It's starting to get more of a crayfish look and feel. 
So we're going to just finish this off with probably the greatest dubbing ever made, Ice Dub. Uh, this is just orange. And we're going to just do a little micro ball of orange. We got some loose thread there. You don't really even need wax for this. Just, just traditional dubbing style. This stuff is so pliable. And we're going to just now wrap. And as I do this, kind of watch. I'm going to start on basically the right edge of my thread and wrap back towards that rabbit because I'm trying to capture that rabbit so it, it pushes that thing forward. And then I basically just back wrap over the top of that. And then I'm going to whip finish. He's going to flip this around. So this, this well, actually looks like a pretty good fly as it is, but it's going to get better. So we're going to pop that guy off. And now we're going to take all of those fibers and stroke them back this way. And then pop your tube off the vise. And you're going to turn this thing around on the vise. And that is the magic of this fly. So I try not to like really get in there and break the stems unless I've got some that are just being a little errant and I just take my thumb and just kind of pop them back because I want that thing to have a lot of volume, right? So you can see that's maybe five turns of marabou and I have a nice big profile. Okay, so flash. In this pattern, I like to use two different flavors. I like copper because all steelheads seem to like copper and then this kind of bronze color. Now, if you want to get fancy, you can stack this all the way around the fly and get all nice and neat. I, to be honest with you, I just kind of tie it in as a wing and then sort of spread it. So I, I'm kind of a big believer in tying with quite a bit of flash. Uh, in this pattern, I'm going to use about one third of the bronze and two thirds of the copper. So I've got maybe, I don't know, 10 strands of the bronze here. And then we're going to take a nice healthy chunk of copper. Copper is definitely a Great Lakes thing, but it, it absolutely rails on the West Coast. And so many people don't fish it out here. And it's like hats off to you guys. You guys totally figured that one out. All right, so... I'm going to just pop that off and then just leave those as full strands. And I'm going to set that aside because I forgot to restart my thread. So we're going to put that to the side. We're going to take our thread again. And then remember, we left that like two millimeters of thread, right, that we backed off. So watch this move. I just grab the marabou, pull it back, grab my thread, and then restart right there. Now we're going to basically take our flash and just double it over the thread, kind of right in half, pull your thread straight up and then slide it down the thread and then capture it. And I usually take it and I just start kind of pulling it to the side a little bit. Um, and it's obviously a little bit long right now, but we're going to spread that out just a little bit more. But before we do, I'm going to chop some of that down. And I like this to be just slightly longer than where the marabou is. But I, I think you guys may have talked about this in one of your videos. Like, don't just cut it off straight because nothing in nature is straight, right? Take your scissors, just open the, open the blade, start about two-thirds of the way down. And you're just going to kind of run the scissors down and just get a bunch of different lengths. That's what's super critical. This is feeling a little bit long, so I'm going to come in. You, when you have all these different lengths, you end up getting all these different points of refraction or reflection from the, from the light off of it. So now you can come in, kind of use your fingernail, spread that out. And one thing to realize, guys, is that you can always pull flash out on the river or cut flash out. That's, that's what's critical. So... Like out here, for example, in, su in summertime especially, typically our fish are eating a lot of flash. But there are days where it seems like they're, you know, they're just, maybe they're spooky, maybe they're whatever, and it's just better to take some of that flash out or have no flash. And I'll just modify that on the river, right? What do you, right, cut, so your, now, what do you cut your flash out with, Tom? Do you just rip it out? Do you use nippers or something or? 
I, yeah, nippers. Yank teeth. it out with your teeth? Well, sometimes I literally just pull it right out, and <laughs> that's it. Yeah. All right, so uh, I've got a really nice skin here, and this is uh, just a, a really nice orange, uh, what's that called? Guinea. Guinea skin. And you can buy that in smaller packages. So you want to get a guinea a feather that's fairly large. Um, but what's key is look at look at where the stem kind of slims down. Sometimes you'll get those feathers where the stem doesn't get really slimmed down till way up here. It's not going to work. So it's okay if you got a little bit of, uh, you know, width on the stem. But try to get one that doesn't have too much. And we're going to dress that just like we did the marabou. And now this I like to have about an inch of material and we're going to do that exact same technique that we've been doing on all the rest of the feather. So just spread everything apart, get that little V and concave side towards me. And now we're going to tie in at that V. And these guys, sometimes it pays to kind of take a wrap in front and then lock it in. This It's a really slick feather. If you're going to pull a feather out, this is the one you usually pull out. And then we're going to, again, just do that same feather folding technique. And on this guy, you're going to notice it's got a little bit more stiffness to the stem, so it kind of helps to kind of pull back and kind of get it at a 90, and then reach around and start folding your feather, just like we did with the other ones. So I'm going to end up getting probably about maybe three turns on this. It's okay to have a little bit of material here because that's going to help really kind of push water. All right. Well, my head's going to be a little bigger than I like it, but I don't think the steelhead are going to care too much. All right. So we'll pop that guy off and try to capture that i left a little bit of a stem there let me see if i can get that off there we go yep that head's way bigger than i want it but say la vie all right so now i'm going to just whip finish and as i do i i like to kind of bring the thread back to the fly and then whip finish down the head and so that my last wrap ends up basically right at the very end and a lot of times with guide flies, I'll just throw a second whip finish on there uh, just because sometimes flies get raked across the bottom. And then we're going to just pop the thread off. And this is a cool trick. If you've never seen this, just take your thread or your scissors, just separate it a little bit, come right up next to the fly and just push it right at it. So that is a reverse marabou. Now you just have one last thing to do here. That's not too long. So you're going to need to melt the uh, the tubes. So typically you want to cut this maybe a, a millimeter, maybe just a little bit more than a millimeter, leave a little nub on there. And then I usually just come in with a flame and you want to use kind of, can you guys see that? Yeah, that's in the frame. You want to just go slow with this. Don't go too terribly fast and just melt that down. And the cool thing is I, I still usually put head cement on this. Um, but that that plastic will actually kind of melt right into uh, into that thread, and then it, it's bar, right? And then the only thing you would uh, you could do here is put a hook keeper on. Although admittedly on this fly, I typically I, I don't. Uh, so I gotta find the tube here. So that is the reverse marabou. And, uh, you know, I'll finish with this fly, guys, just saying that, like, the cool thing is you can literally, like, tie this thing in a million different colors, right? I, when I used to go up to Alaska and British Columbia and host trips, I would take, like, four or five giant boxes. I'd have weighted flies and unweighted flies and intruders and marabous and all this crap. Literally, now, when I go to those destination fisheries, I pretty much just take a box of these and like I said, you can stack them, you can add a weight to them. One of the things I did do on the Pier Marquette um, when I was fishing there last, which was a while back, but um, I just took a split shot to weight it. I just pulled my tube forward and 
just pinched a split shot right in front of that knot. And that way the fly rode right up against the split shot because the PM is, as you guys know, there's, you know, the head of a pool is like six, seven feet deep. You get into the gut and it's like five and then it tails out and it's a short pool, right? So realistically you would have three different sink tips to fish all of that. Now with that split shot thing, and, and I will tell you, you can you can cast that split shot off pretty easy if you're, especially if you're whipping your snap tees. But um, but it's a cool way to just like, oh, I need to get deep in that little pocket right there. Pop a split shot on and and uh, and get it down. It's kind of a cool way to do it. I've also played with. Um, this is kind of a cool way to do it. You have to put a a, a hook keeper on there, um, but pro. Uh, ProTubes makes these uh, these raw weights. They're like little tungsten donuts, and you can slide that over the back of the tube and then put a hook keeper on it, and now you've got a weighted fly as well. So that's another way to rig it. That is a slick rigging yeah, system, Tom. That's that's go. really awesome. Yeah. Well, and you know one other thing, guys. That and I think this is really relative to your to your fishery, fishery uh, especially. So much of where those steelheads sit in rivers like the PM rivers like uh, the Manistee, not quite as much on like the Muskegon, uh, but you guys have a ton of wood, right? And the right. steelhead are using that wood to hold on. And so the thing is with a size four or even a size two with 10 pound Maxima, and I'm sure I fish mostly Maxima, uh, but with a fairly heavy leader, uh, you can just, just pull slowly and just point your rod straight at the fly. And a lot of times you can bend the, the hook out and then not lose your fly, which is really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a killer. I like that uh, variety um, as far as throwing different colors at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's super cool, man. And you know, if you if you start running, uh, you know, a separate cone, you can you know make it an egg sucking version like this fly is. Um, it's really cool. You know, they make cones that. If you know, like, oh, I'm going to fish this fly deep. It's a winter fly. You know, you can you can melt a cone onto the front before you finish it, and that works really well. But uh, yeah, so it's kind of a fun pattern. It it really was inspired by uh, the Sea Run Cutthroat guys out here on the coast. They fish these reverse spiders, and uh, for all the reasons that they do it, it, this fly works exceptionally well. And I have literally caught steelhead on this thing from the Great Lakes all the way up into Alaska. I've caught tons of Chinook salmon. Uh, it's one of our best patterns. I know a number of guides, uh, Justin Perbanic over in the uh, in the Ohio, Pennsylvania area. He loves this pattern. He fishes it a ton. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a very cool fly. In fact, you know, Dave Pinchkowski, since he's on here, here's my ode to Dave. He loved fishing. He had this fly. He calls it a deer hunter. It's a little different. It's a little bit more orange, but he loved fishing black and or I'm, I'm sorry, pink and orange. Um, the great or the, uh, Wisconsin fish seem to like brighter patterns, uh, more so than the Michigan fish and those fish will eat the kind of buggy, you know, kind of sculpiny looking stuff just as well, but <clears throat> you can get away. They have really tannic water over there, so you can get away with some brighter flies. Nice. Nice. That is, uh, that's a great pattern. And you know, when we talk about different fisheries, I, I noticed that you, uh, you're you not afraid to call Great Lakes fish steelhead. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. You look at all the memes, and wow, is it just, uh, you know, wow. It's just, it's it's a rough, that's a rough thing. You know, it's really funny, man. It's uh, I used to get into arguments with guys, um, you know, pride, right? Right. And the funny thing is the vast majority of people that say that out here, have probably never even seen a Great Lakes, right? They've never stood on the shore of Lake Superior or Lake Michigan and went, holy crap, like it's an inland sea, right? right. And so they, I think people kind of think of it as like, you know, it's just that they don't understand the scale. But, um, no. you know, if you wanted to find steelhead <clears throat> as they've got to go to saltwater, that's fine, whatever. But what I've, what I've never understood which camera are you on? Are you on the big camera or the flat nope, camera? No, we're on the... You're on your wide. You're on your wide one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, you know, what I've never understood about that whole thing is, you know, we... 
as steel letters, right? It doesn't matter if you live in New York State, you live in, you know, Washington, where I live. We we all do it for the same reason, right? I mean, we love to feel the the grab. I mean, that's why we fish, right? We love spay casting. We love just picking apart badass steelhead water and and just holding them are just steelhead are just cool critters right so our motivations are always the same and i don't know why people in this world want to create these divides um it's it's a it's a strange thing to me because i can tell you man i mean i was one of the founding members of the deschutes river alliance and i used to guide many many anglers i'm sure some of them are on here uh, from the Midwest. And I know many of them that donated to the Deschutes River Alliance uh, because they're advocates of it, right? So why don't we celebrate what we have in common instead of getting nitpicky about it? And, and I'll just finish this, Pitts. You know, I, I mean, I fish the Dean River a lot and I've never caught steelhead that are as strong as the Dean. Uh, but the only other river that rivals it were the fall fish on the Manistee. And I would tell you that if you took a Deschutes River fish and you took a Manistee River fish and you put them in the exact same river and tied them tail to tail, I think a Manistee fish would win that battle most of the time. So call it whatever the hell you want, but they're badass, man. That's all I know. (laughs) (laughs) It's addictive. They do kick ass. I mean, even Matt and I were out a couple weeks ago and a winter fish, I mean, it, I had it up to the boat three times before I landed it, and it, it just, absolutely was just was it had me. Man. It was it, it was ripped going. me, and yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it was a, a marvelous fight. And I've had some guys, you know, when I was working for Umqua, that came out from the West Coast and fished even our you know March fish, which usually aren't that hot, right? And, oh my gosh, you know they were they were amazed at the fight. Yeah. But the big difference too, you know, I will give credit to. You know, the West Coast steelhead, obviously, because our fish are a little bit lazier. You know, they're the top of the food <laughs> chain, right? So they're not right. as apt to, like, they don't see a swung fly and chase it down, right? Like, sometimes they do, right? It, it, but right. they're a little bit lazier. They're, you really have to, uh, you know, be in that right bite window. And, and as you know, I mean, they're finicky as as any steelhead anywhere in the world. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity to fish steelhead with you on the shoots. And, you know, I think the last time we did that was the day Lily was born, <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> so the, the reason why Brian is laughing is because, uh, yeah, he was visiting me in Maupin and I was working, uh, working for John Hazel and Amy Hazel at the time. And, uh, I was just freaking broke, man. I mean, I was just a fish bum. Right. And so. My truck was maybe not in as good of maintenance as it should have been. And so we get this call that, oh, that at Brian me for? is going into labor and, you know, obviously early. Uh, and uh, he needs to get home. So we don't actually know how fast we were going down the highway because my speedometer didn't work. <laughs> right. I just told him we were going fast. And you, did you, you were like very, you were very close to making the birth, but you didn't make it, did you? I didn't make it. So, you know, we were standing oh, on the boat the launch. I think the day before we had landed four fish and you had, you, you rose a couple on dries. I rose one on dries. I mean, it was a, we had a great day. And, you know, as you remember out there, you fish pretty much pre sun to sundown. You know, taking the nap yeah. on the side of the river, and we're all jazzed up to go. But we had spoken with Dee Dee that evening, and she's like, "Yeah, I think I might be going into labor." And you and I just look at each other like, "Oh yeah, right, whatever, dude." You're like, we're gonna do the box canyon float, and we'll see you in three days. Like, this is this will be fine. And yeah, we get the phone call. You're standing at the boat launch. We had the boat in the water because we're like, "There's no way." Of course, she's at the hospital saying. You know, oh my gosh, you got to, you're gonna have a kid today, and you're like, Brian, I just had a fish boil on my fly. Let me catch this one before we go. <laughs> and then yeah, your, yeah. your gas I, gauge, been a, been a, I, I think your gas gauge them. didn't work, and yeah, uh, the speedometer didn't work, and but you know, 
and, and we, you know, thankfully made it to the hospital in time. They held the plane for me. It was the best uh, customer service by any airline I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, basically ruined my whole phone battery on the way trying to find a flight out. Uh, but we got it to the airport on time. And then we, you had this little purple uh, spay fly that you, you called the lily. That uh, I remember. Was, remember that? Yeah. 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 Caught some fish on it, too. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's been fun. Just you know, I've been kind of part of both of your kids' births and growing up, and watching you guiding full time, trying to be a dad. And oh my gosh, man, it's it's cool to see how you know how they've. Uh, cool. Well, you know, Tom. You know, we're talking about how many days a year we used to guide. And uh, this fall, I think I did 56 days in a row. Yeah, that's that's a good <laughs> one. That's good. I think that's actually my record was 56. Yeah, I that's, think I did that 56 is a lot days. Of work. Yeah, I have to laugh because I, I hear Rocky Mountain Trout guides talk about. Um, they're like, oh yeah, I do like 100 days a season, and I'm like, oh, tough guy. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? 250. <laughs> 230. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I was down in Mexico. But you know, it was so cool about that, and I think this is the thing I miss about guiding the most, is that when you're out there at that frequency, that long in the season, right, you become so in tune with all of these little microscopic changes that happen, right? Right. And you're changing your program as the river is changing. and. It's, I will tell you, not being a guide now, uh, having, having a real job, uh, <laughs> is, uh, it, it's hard, man. Steelheading is not easy when you're not out there every day. It, it's a lot, lot more difficult. Um, but that's what I miss about guiding. I, I miss my, my clients. I had some very dear friends that I used to guide. And I, I miss being that in tune with an ecosystem uh, that you, you just, you know, the wind switches 10 degrees and you notice it, right? Those are those little things, uh, that you, you kind of lose touch with and, and, uh, yeah, just being that close and having that kind of a relationship and being able to anticipate it as best as a person can, uh, is a, it's a pretty special thing. Absolutely. I feel out of touch if I take a day or two off. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm, I feel really out of touch all the time. <laughs> I don't catch as many fish. Like, oh, dude, like, you're you know. you're one of the fishiest guys I know. You and Jay. Oh my uh, gosh. Speaking of which, Jay just tuned yeah, in Jay and uh, commented and said uh, he got a little screwed up on the time change, but uh, he said, "What's up, everybody?" So he just tuned <laughs> in. Jay Niederstadt in the house. Uh, so do we have time to tie another fly? I've kind of been yapping a bunch. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Tom. Let her rip. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll, to do I'll, it. I'll, get, I'll go a little bit faster on this one. Uh, just, just a quick backstory. It's great that that Jay jumped on. Um, this is a fly that I would say that uh, was very much influenced by the Midwest, and it's kind of funny because, you know, when uh, when Jay had, had taken a little uh, break from guiding and had gone back to guiding, he really kind of made this commitment to uh, to to just swing or swing as much as possible. And so he and I oftentimes would be trading ideas from the West Coast to the East Coast or Midwest as it is. And um, we kind of came up with a fly, I think, pretty similar uh, as how, how we were rigging it and how, you know, how we were tying it. And so this fly has a lot of Michigan in it uh, and it has become one of the one of the greatest flies. Now, one thing for those of you in the Midwest, um, are you still on the big camera, Matt? Yes. Or, OK. So uh, one, one thing for those of you in the Midwest that you have to understand is that when I moved out to the Deschutes, um, and, and I had lived out there for a couple years when I was younger and had fished it a bunch, but the, the, the thought process on the Deschutes was you can't catch fish during the middle of the day uh, fly fishing. It just wasn't done. So you would get up at the butt crack of dawn, you would fish until you know, maybe 11, 12 o'clock, and then you would eat lunch and take a nap under a tree. And then when the shade got on the water, uh, you go back out there and, and go fishing. And from a dry line perspective, that's still fairly true, right? Uh, so I, I guess like one of the things that 
that I really tried to figure out was how to consistently catch fish in the middle of the day. And so in talking with Jay and talking about Flashaboo and some of the stuff that he was doing, I started incorporating that a lot into my flies. And I'll never forget, man. I mean, I tied this fly or a version of this. It was purple with a chartreuse head, great flash. And the very first run we fished, and the sun is like right in the fish's face, uh, we jacked five on it. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I think, you know, this is kind of the, the kind of talking about guiding and seeing how things change. What was really interesting about it is this fly fished amazing. And then it stopped working. And it literally took me almost three years to figure out what the deal was. And it's all about flashaboo color. So the general rule of thumb for us out in the, in the West Coast, and I, I can't speak that much to the Midwest on this, uh, and maybe you guys can add something to this, uh, but typically the earlier in the season, now keep in mind, we're starting our steelhead fishing out here right after the 4th of July on the Deschutes, and it goes all the way up until about Thanksgiving. So early season in that July, August early September time frame, the fish definitely respond to kind of brighter flash colors. So that, that grape has like silver, purple, blue, and pink in it, right? And what I figured out over years of kind of trying different stuff was that the later in the season, the darker the flash color that seems to be better, right? So black, copper, bronze, stuff like that. So I, I played with a lot of different colors, hmm. like, you know, Kelly green and copper is a huge color in the Great Lakes. Hats off yeah. to Kevin Feenstra. Yeah, I think he was the guy that, you know, probably discovered that. Um, Jay was playing with that green copper combination, um, black copper. And so I ended up kind of taking that back. And, and so for me, I have different flavors of Flashaboo with basically the same fly in either black or purple which are two colors that work really, really well in our river. Uh, and I, I kind of change colors through the season. So um, so just know, just like the reverse marabou, uh, you know, you can kind of play with different colors. So this, this particular pattern is the one that I probably fish most starting in kind of early fall and then all the way through the fall. And it catches winter fish too. It's a, it's a good, good pattern for that. But uh, yeah, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we rip it out? I'm gonna start with basically, Matt, you wanna switch screens? Yep. All right. So I'm going to use the exact uh, exact same thread, just a six saw. And on this fly, I'm not going to take off the little nipple. I'm going to leave that on. Uh, and, and basically, we're going to use that uh, because we're going to use a hook keeper on this fly. It's going to have lead eyes on it, so it will be keeled. Uh, in other words, it's going to be kind of in a static position where, you know, the reverse marabou is tied more in the round and it kind of can kind of you know, do its thing down there and kind of flitter around. This is very much going to be tied so that the fly is in one attitude. And the reason for that is because through many, many, many experiments, what I have found is that, and I get this question a lot, do you like to fish your hook down or your hook up? And what I found is that we seem to land way more fish when the hook is down. And especially in the wintertime, I'm not like dredging the bottom, or I'm sorry, in the summertime, I'm not trying to get the fly way deep. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if we're fishing four or five feet of water, I don't think the fly is much deeper than maybe two feet. So having that hook down just seems to land more fish. All right, so we're gonna start this guy kind of towards about mid, mid tube again. And actually I'm gonna go back just a little bit from that. And I'm just gonna go towards the back and come fairly close to the little nipple, break off the thread. And I'm gonna start right away with that dubbing loop. Same technique we used on the last fly, spin it around a couple of times. We are going to grab our little shepherd's crook dubbing spinner. And then again, just add a little bit of wax to that and use your non-rabbit fingers, the fingers you don't want rabbit sticking to. And then we are going to do just this very similar technique. I'm going to just take some rabbit strip 
And again, I don't want uh, too terribly much here. I just want to get maybe a half an inch. I can go a little heavier on this fly than, than the last fly. And we're going to just cut that right along right along the edge of the, uh, the hide and insert that into our loop. I made this loop a little longer than it needs to be. Just kind of capture that. And then I'm going to just even out the tips. Both of these flies, I, I will tell you guys, I, <laughs> I, I don't cry when we lose one of these. And I went through this phase when, you know, when intruders came out, um, you know, I will say that the intruder is probably one of the more revolutionary things that's happened in steelhead fishing because, I mean, really fly lines really changed because of the intruder. We, you know, Skagit heads became a necessity to throw these big, long flies. Um, and therefore, you know, sink tips changed, spay rods changed, everything kind of changed because of the intruder. And intruders work great. Uh, <laughs> the one thing about intruders out West that I've noticed is now that everyone is fishing them, they're not nearly as effective as they once were. Um, and in the Midwest, you guys don't have shrimp and prawn and squid. So I don't think they're as effective in the Midwest as they are out West where I, I fish them a lot is, uh, when I'm close to the salt water and I know that I've got really fresh fish around, um, at that point I fish a lot of intruders, but I went through this phase where I mean, I was tying, I tied for, you know, freaking eight hours, uh, tying eight intruders and I wouldn't have any intruders left by the end of the week. And it was just, it was no bueno, man. Uh, so they're cool flies, but I mean, especially in the Midwest, especially in the rivers in Northern Michigan, um, man, you guys have so much wood that fishing a fly that you are going to probably lose doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, both of these flies are flies that, you know, you can rip out really quick. They don't have to be the most pretty, most beautiful flies in the world. All right, so we got a nice little collar, about two, three turns of rabbit. And now we are going to use a piece of uh, wood duck flank. And again, you got a concave side, convex side. So I've got that concave side. And really, you know, when you look at this feather, this is a kind of a, a right side feather. So you can see the predominant longer fibers are on this side. I honestly, I, I, I'll use this for, sometimes I'll just tie them backwards because I'll have a bunch of lefts left over. Um, but I, I'm gonna dress that feather down and I'm, I'm really, I'm gonna leave this and I'm gonna split it, but I'm, I want these black and white stripes. Remember how we were talking about breakup in the last pattern, right? That's why I'm tying this on here. And I'm going to shorten that up. I don't like these to be super long, um, maybe an inch and a half at most, inch and a quarter. Um, I, Because I also want them to create some push under the fly. So we only want maybe two wraps, a wrap and a half of this. So I'm going to go, you know, maybe a half an inch of, of feather, maybe just a little bit more. Um, you don't want to get super heavy with this. And we're going to do that feather tying technique or folding technique, just like we've done. Lock that baby in. And now we're going to just grab the stem and come vertical. Reach around and grab it. And so you can kind of see now, because I used the right side feather, that those that barring is really predominant and it's, it's really kind of showing. And so you can actually take this pattern and, and modify it into a sculpin by doing a spun deer hair head. It's of Indian hen, um, but it looks freaking awesome. And I, I fished that fly a ton in Alaska. So we got that nice little breakup. Now I'm gonna take a piece of rabbit strip and, you know, when you're looking at rabbit strip, um, look at the packages in the store. I had a really, really good piece of rabbit strip somewhere, and I don't know where the heck it went. I tried to be prepared for this. There it is. All right. So I typically take, so I try to look for the rabbit strip that has those nice, long, kind of soft fibers, because they're going to move a lot better in the water. Um, sometimes you'll get those really short, stubby ones, and 
Honestly, officials still eat it, but I, they just don't move as well. So I'm out here in the West. I mean, I've caught fish on three inch. You know, I'll cut the hide at like three inches. Um, but honestly, like this one right now is about two and a half. I'm going to cut it down to about two inches. And that's, I'm measuring the hide. I have a ruler in front of me. You guys probably can't see it. Um, and then I'm going to take that rabbit strip and the very back of it, I'm just going to, I'm just going to round off the edges, just kind of give it a little bevel. I'll show this to you in a second. Well, I think it's time for new scissors. <laughs> and we're going to just create a nice little point and that'll just help that strip kind of see that now. Um, there we go. So just create a little point there with the, the rabbit strip. And then I'm going to just tie that in. And a lot of times here, I'm going to add just a little bit of Zappa Gap. Um, you remember durability we talked about is one of the things that we really like. So a little bit of Zappa Gap uh, goes, it's unbelievable how much stronger it makes it. I've literally had fish just rip the rabbit strip right off this pattern. Tom, have you played right. around with that uh, possum, those possum strips by Wapsie? It's a have, little bit yeah. longer. On a lot of trout bait streamers, I've kind of played with them, and they're awesome. They, get, they really kind of get that nice subtle movement. Um, it's, it's really good, yeah. All right, so this guy, we're gonna. I'm, I'm about to reveal some secret society stuff here, guys. But Ooh, this is what you get. Secret for password or a. Uh, it's a what's the? So password? we're gonna use two different colors of flash. Safe word. One of them is going to be a holographic black flashaboo. And then one of them is going to be a mirage. It's called Opal Copper Pits. Do you have this in the store? We do. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know, like regular copper works great. Uh, and I've, I've certainly caught hundreds of steel I probably on regular copper. Something about this Opal Mirage, when they eat this, when they eat this fly, like there is no messing around. I mean, they, in the words of Dave Pinchkowski, they garwaffle it. <laughs> I mean, they found it. It's, it's, I mean, it's a noticeable difference, and the amount of fish that I actually land, I really believe goes up because when they eat this thing, they are really trying to kill it. Um, so, Can you spell uh, garwaffle? What is that? Combination. So, it's what's that? I'm trying to spell garwaffle. Struggling here. I don't, yeah. Dave Pinchkowski. I just totally <laughs> screwed this up. Pulled way too much out. So, if I was tying this for the Deschutes, I would probably go about that much copper. I'm going to probably, for the Midwest, I'm going to probably double that. Um, you know, I think one of the big differences uh, between Midwest fish and West Coast fish is that, in general, our fish are not necessarily eating for, you know, sustaining their body, right? They're eating out of a reaction. They're eating out of, you know, competition. They're, and, and I, I don't say, I won't, I wouldn't say that they don't eat because I've seen plenty of steelhead out there, you know, eating caddis or bluing olives or whatever. Um, but I think the fish in the Midwest they still very much eat in your rivers. And so um, I think that this copper, and this is a conversation that Jay and I just recently had, uh, Jay Niederstadt, for those of you that just joined, um, you know, he was telling me about how when he did shocking studies in your area uh, with fish and wildlife, that like all of the sculpins in, the, in that area had like kind of a copper colored belly. And so I can't take any credit for that. That's all Jay. Um, but it, it, it makes sense. And I mean, the, the fish just freaking eat it. All right. So I like to kind of just kind of sort through, just kind of play with this, kind of roll it in my fingers and get the, get the, the all the different fibers to kind of mesh together. And I'm going to take a, just a, I've got a little bit more than I want. So I'm going to take a few out, a couple more. All right. So we're going to do that same deal. And you're kind of getting a big head at this point. 
don't worry about it because you're going to end up covering it with uh, with slopping as well as uh, some dubbing. So it's okay if it starts to get bulky. So same deal here. I want this to be kind of a staggered flash. So I'm using, God, are these scissors dull? So I'm using kind of the, the, the scissors just spreading it apart. And this is definitely more flash than I would fish on the West Coast. Um, but certainly on your rivers in the Midwest, that is not too much. And again, you can always pull it out, right? So there's always that. All right. Now, a few just a little bit longer than I want. All right. So before I actually tie that schloppen in, I, I, I realized I actually usually start with the eyes, and I didn't tie those in. So let me tie my eyes in. And I don't know where they're at. There they are. So the, the size that I use more than anything is like a 316th dazzle eye. Um, on this one, I use gold, but you can use different, you know, different colors that will match the fly. Like when I tie a purple and chartreuse, I use silver. Purple and pink, silver works good. Uh, but gold looks really, really good with this. So I'm going to just come forward, create a thread wrap. I want to leave enough room here to make my schloppen come down as well as I want an egg behind this. So uh, I want to try to get this wrap pretty vertically here because that's going to kind of be my edge because you're going to see I'm actually going to finish the fly with the whip finish behind the eyes, which makes it really durable. So bring that thread back up, flip this guy over, and then tie those eyes in. And typically what I like to do is I make maybe six, seven wraps one way and then pull back on itself. And as you do that, kind of straighten that out. Just check your orientation, make sure it's straight up. And then at that point, I am going to effectively make some wraps around kind of the base of the eyes. And that'll really lock that thing in. And usually at that point, too, I'm going to add just a little bit of, uh, of Zappa Gap. Um, because those eyes over time can spin, especially when they get kind of hung up. So I just add just a dap onto that, and that's all you need. All right, so we're going to go back up now to our, our collar of schloppen. And when you pick one of these feathers, guys, you want to have, you want to look for one that has a nice thin stem and doesn't get too thick too far up and you want some of this kind of marabou-y under fluff that that stuff works really good to kind of finish the fly and so we're going to just dress this like every feather we've done so far i'm going to take out some of the under fluff but not all of it i'm going to leave some of that and now this time guys you like you want this heavy like you want a lot of fibers here so i'm going to use oh the almost maybe two inches right so fairly big big amount of material and again concave side towards me just like we've been doing and we're going to just create that nice little v and we're going to tie in right at the v and we'll grab our hackle pliers and just start wrapping this and you know, sometimes you got kind of a big bump there. It's it's okay. It's you got enough material that you can kind of take your time, and you're still going to put on a nice big egg in front of this. I'm just wetting my fingers. I got a couple fibers there that were kind of kind of stuck. Just wrap it forward. And usually if you've got enough fibers, you've now kind of covered that whole bump that was created by the rabbit, right? And secure that guy in. And we just have one step left at this point. And before I put the egg on, I like to come in and just give it a little comb, get all those fibers out, prune, primp, you know, Make it look pretty. It. Make it look pretty. It's got so much flashy boo on it right now. 
it's going to freaking steal it. are going to see that from a mile away. All right. So last step. Um, now I know some guys with this style of fly, they will literally just tie it. Your fly just isn't very durable at that point. So I do the, the dubbing loop. Uh, and, and I basically bring my thread forward and just kind of get it out of the way. And on this, I don't, however, add any wax to it because I don't want the I don't want the egg necessarily to be super tight. Um, it kind of depends. In the Midwest, it seems like a, a little bigger egg seems to work better out west. I'll just do a, a traditional dub and just do a dubbing ball. But I'm going to kind of pick apart and kind of get a, a good clump. It's okay if this is kind of loose. Um, and we're going to just start stacking pieces of dubbing up into the dubbing loop at this point. And don't be like, don't be too afraid to have some material here because it's going to help push the fly. You know, as it goes through the water, it's going to create more of a more of an audible footprint, if you will. That's a very Dave Pinchkowski ism. Audible footprint. I like that. The audible. I don't know if he called it the footprint, but. He was the first guy that really kind of talked to me about making flies that created, you know, some disturbance. So we're going to spin this guy, but I'm not going to let it get uh, super, super tight on this. And again, I'm tying this more as if I was coming to the Manistee to fish. Uh, not so much. I would use less dubbing on a West Coast fly. Uh, and part of that is, you know, when you're fishing on a river like, you know, the Deschutes, for example, uh, or the click a tad or any of the rivers in my neck of the woods. When, when you've got these big ledges and giant boulders, there's a lot more hydraulics. So it's harder to get your fly deeper, right? The cool thing about the Midwest, and it, it actually kind of freaked me out when I fished there last. Um, cause I started thinking about it. Like when I, when I go steelhead fishing, like if you just drop me out onto a river randomly and said, go catch a steelhead. What I am looking for first is water speed relative to the water temperature, right? So in the winter, I'm looking for that kind of slower, softer stuff. In the summertime, I'm looking for like a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, upwelling. I'm looking for a lot of oxygen. And so those are the two extremes, right? Um, but what's interesting is you go to like the Muskegon, for example, and everything's the right speed. <laughs> it's harder to... You know, like you can look at a West Coast run and go, they're going to live right there, right? But like you go to your runs and you're like, dude. And then there's all of this like corrugated bottom and it doesn't it, like it shows, but it doesn't show. I mean, they're mysterious. The rivers in your area have a lot of mystery, which is what I love about them. All right. So I'm going to start this egg and I'm I'm actually going to kind of start right next to the, uh, the schloppen. And again, I'm kind of going to use like a feather folding technique. Um, I'm kind of pulling everything back. I don't want to necessarily trap a bunch of fibers underneath because I want that egg to kind of flare out and and create almost almost a sculpiny head. And so now I've got the the egg on there, and I'm going to now back wrap, and then I'm going to tuck my thread behind my eyes to finish this. And so I'm going to capture that thread back there. And what's cool about oh, this, and I, I'm not shy at adding wraps here. A lot of times I'll do the same thing I did with the, um, you know, with the dubbing loop. I'll wrap it around a couple of times. Um, and then I just, when I whip finish this, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to whip finish behind the eyes. And as you do this, you try not to capture any material back there, but inevitably you, you will. And there you go. And so now we just come forward, pop that off, you know, maybe a millimeter out in front, and then give it the little, give it the flame. Right in the camera there. You are. Oh, we did have a question Good. about what's the best lighter for this. Uh... It's not a white lighter. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Somebody did ask, is this a prom dress variant? No. No, prom no, dress doesn't have not. that uh, rabbit strip, right. if I believe. Uh, yep. Now, this guy, when you when you uh, finish this guy, you really want to have one of these hook keepers. 
Um, they're just these little rubber silicone deals because remember what I was talking about with uh, oh, yeah, we gotta get the little nipple on the back. So we're going to put that Pulse. right over that nipple. And now that's going to help orient that hook because when I pull that stinger loop inside of there, that will create some friction and help keep that, help keep that uh, hook pointed straight down and not moving around. So that is the tube leech uh, with all the flash. And yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's funny because I, I kind of made reference to this earlier about the prom dress thing. I mean, literally Scott and I were having a conversation. He, he asked me, how much flash boo are you using? I was like, dude, you can't use too much. And I saw him a few months later at the spade clave. And he showed me what was his prom dress. And it was funny because I pulled out my fly box and I had a very similar fly, um, but it was tied on a tube. In fact, that's it right there, which is basically a tube prom dress, right? Now, the cool thing is when you tie this on a tube like this, you could take a, a marabou and stack it in front of it and then create Drop a bigger that down, profile. Tom. Drop that down oh, a sorry. little bit. That's okay. There you go. Yeah. So super flashy. So yeah, I mean, you know, Scott's is a little bit different than this, but the concept is pretty similar. Um, and I don't know, maybe Scott was screwing around with flash way before that, but uh, I just remember him saying like, he told me that when, when he was fishing on the North Umpqua, uh, he would literally, he would tell his guy before he threw it out there, you're going to catch one fish and I'm going to take this fly off. <laughs> and the north is really the north is different than like on the the Deschutes you've got this kind of constant flow of fish coming by you right they move around on on the north like those fish come up into the fly water at Steamboat Creek and they just park and they're just waiting to go up Steamboat or waiting to go up river so he was really careful about not showing it to too many fish and he was like dude it's so effective um that i i just don't want to i don't want to sting all the fish so so tom uh, I thought that was interesting do you remember my story of the first day of the umqua sales meeting oh no i've heard of this and one. we are on the north umqua <laughs> oh. <laughs> and we're staying at the steamboat inn and they tell me go down and catch you know go down you should fish these three spots before the sales meeting and i hooked four fish Wow. With with the Michigan stuff, and nobody believed me, but the owner of the lodge was jogging by as I was landing my second one, or my actually my fourth one, and I go, I showed up late for breakfast, and they're like, "You you what? Like there's no way you're lying." And then the the guy came in, and I'm like, "No, dude, I I hooked like four fish, and landed two, and and they're like, "What were you?" I'm like, "These little flashy, you know, like." You know, I basically was just using, like, Great Lakes flies, and they were stacked into those pools at the mouth of Steamboat Creek, and, I mean, they were just coming up. And, I mean, it was, like, it was stupid, <laughs> honestly. <Yeah. laughs> now, Nobody Pitch, believed me. You weren't chipping and ducking in the fly water. No, <laughs> no, no. I knew better than that. But I'm, I was using the flashy, you know, little, like, those swing spays that we always use, you know, with the, but with yeah. flash. You know, and yeah. I was stack minning it and like swinging it down low. It was hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. I have to tell you, this is a great, great story about the North Umpqua. And it, it, for those of you who have never been to the North, uh, unfortunately, they had a pretty big fire this last summer and parts of the river uh, got pretty, pretty scorched. But it's still probably one of the most amazing places on the face of the planet. And Catching a steel on the north is like a, it's a rite of passage, right? And it's it's incredibly difficult water uh, to wade to fish. It doesn't look like I just didn't even know where to stand in the damn thing, right? So, uh, and it's not all that bad, but it, it's pretty burly. So, uh, at one point, I actually had applied for a job with Umqua Feather Merchants, and um, I don't know if I've ever told you this story, Brian, but. Uh, so I went down and I interviewed and, and it, it went pretty well. And, uh, and I had the rest of the day, uh, to, to fish. And then I had to drive home, which was like a four hour drive for me. But so of course I'm on the North, I'm going to fish. So, uh, most of the pools there have names and they're really historical. Right. And so I am in lower boat pool. Oh, which is that's kind of, where I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
right below the steamboat inn. I mean, it's an iconic pool, right? Upper boat, and lower boat. On, and, and this was like in the kind of early days of intruders. Like, like I, a, a lot of guides knew about them, but I, I don't think the kind of the, the the average consumer had really really heard about them yet. And so I'm fishing down, and uh, and this guide puts a client in at the top of the run behind me. And, uh, and I'm watching and his, his guy's really struggling and I can tell this, this guide is watching me and he finally just walks down and he's like, he goes, Hey man, I don't mean to bug you, but he goes, is that that snap T cast I keep hearing about? And it was like pretty early on in the snap T cast. Right. And I was like, yeah, man, he goes, do you mind if I just watch you? Because I'm, I've been trying to figure out how this thing works. And I'm like, well, Hey man, I'm a guide casting instructor. I'll, I'll just kind of give you some pointers on how to teach it. So I, I kind of walked him through it and he was so stoked and he kind of looked at my fly and he's like, you know, I don't think you're going to catch anything on that thing here. <laughs> and he <laughs> opens his fly box and it's, it's what you remember those old scientific angler, those big gray boxes that they had, right? Uh, it was literally, you couldn't see any foam. It was packed with one pattern and he pulls this thing out and it's like this four X long streamer hook with like a green bucktail tail that's almost as long as a streamer hook, a gold body, a white natural bucktail wing, and a head on it of deer hair like the size of a ping pong. And he goes, man, I know it doesn't look like much, but he goes, do you know who Frank Moore is? I was like, yeah, I know who Frank Moore is. And he goes, this is Frank's ugly mother. He goes, it's all I fish. And he, and he gave one to me, which was pretty cool. And so uh, I fished the rest of the day, kind of poking around, and he gave me a couple spots to check out. And it was the last run of the day, and I'm working down as that, like, perfect evening light. And I'm just kind of, like, loving being there, but um, I haven't touched the fish. And so I'm, I'm going to tie on a fly right before dark. I open the box. And I, I can't tell you the last time I fished somebody else's fly. Like, I just fish my own stuff. But... For some reason, I tied that muddler on and, uh, yeah, caught my very first North Umpqua steelhead on it. So don't question local That's knowledge, cool. I guess. But Dean Finnerty was the guide's name, and I got to know him later. And, of course, that was, that was a pretty cool moment. That's very cool, Tom. That's cool. <clears throat> very cool. Well, Gee, thanks for sharing all yeah. your knowledge, man. A few questions from the crowd. We... Uh, uh, Jay is uh, actually asking how many chickens it does uh, Tom currently wrangle, I believe, <laughs> is the question. I, mean, I have three right now. Ooh. I started with four. And we, had, <laughs> we had some chicken trauma, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they're, they're cool. If you guys are thinking about getting into chickens, they're just cool little critters. And having fresh eggs every day is it's awesome. It's a, it's a cool experience. So it's done. I, I had to it's, do something. But. It's I've done that too. It's nice. Uh, just be ready, ready to shovel a little bit um, every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. They they do poop. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Tom, um, we do, I wanted to, like, I, I don't know, we're going to have to post this, but this is a picture of this you and great. I. The goatee is epic. I was looking for one with your ponytail, but this is a picture of you and I um, dating back uh, into... Dude, the ponytail days were rough. This was, um, <laughs> this was back in 99. This is a printed picture. I don't know if you people have ever seen one of these. This is... Uh, you used to get one of these, and you'd go to, like, CVS, and they'd have a 24-hour... I'm just kidding. So, we had already got it together, you know, a couple of years, probably, by 99. But this is a great picture of the two of us. I think your boat's name was yeah, Hope or waiter. Faith. Was it Hope or Faith? My, my boat was, was Hope. Hope, uh, that's then, right. And uh, Larry Rainey decided to name his boat Faith. Faith, right. So, so course, Hope and every faith. single day I got the question, who's got charity? <laughs> I'm like, thanks, sir. Thanks. <laughs> Mine was Bertha. <laughs> it was Bertha. Yeah. That was, oh, you know. Dead I did have the Bertha Grateful Dead sticker. I still run dead stickers on my stuff. Everywhere. Oh, everywhere. Uh, we got a question from Rob who's asking Are you now a uh, currently a Skagit specific angler or do you uh, meddle at all? in uh 
Scandi. In Scandi. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, I came out with a fly line. Uh, so I also designed fly lines with Airflow fly lines. And uh, we came out with a, a line a while back, maybe six, seven years ago, called the Rage. And it's it's really a very aggressive Scandi taper, right? And so kind of depending on how you line it, it can be a very, you know, short, kind of aggressive stroke, very Scandi-esque. Or if you line it a little heavier, it can be more like a Skagit. Uh, but it's just an aggressive floating line. So, um, and I still fish regular Scandis all the time because they're fun. Um, but I do fish the Rage. It, it's just a good line around here because we have a lot of wind in the Columbia Gorge. And uh, not a lot of back casting room in a lot of our rivers. And it turns over big foam skaters and muddlers and stuff like that really well. So... Um, so, uh, you know, I fish, you know, in the summertime, you'll find me fishing a, a dry line, either a rage or a scandy in the mornings. And, uh, and then midday I'll be fishing a Skagit, but in the winter it's all Skagit. But this is actually a really funny story about the rage because, you know, when you name a product, right, it's this ridiculous thing. You like, there's always a whiteboard involved and it takes forever. Like, cause you think you have a great name and you go online, you do a trademark or a copyright search, and it's like, oh, we can't use that. And so it's really difficult to name new products. And admittedly, like the rage was like, I don't know. We were like, well, you know, it rages through the wind, whatever. So we came out with it, and it kind of got a little bit of flack on like spay pages and stuff like that, but whatever. Uh, so the one of the really great things about product design uh, is when you actually get to see someone using your stuff you're like wow somebody actually bought my shit that's cool uh so the 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 first time i saw rage it was a super hot night on the deschutes i mean it must have been at 98 100 degrees and we're coming down river i've got two customers in the boat and so i i, I drive a, a 20 foot willy jet boat with a 200 horse tiller on it and so it goes really fast so we're like running down river right and i can see this guy He's, he's in a run called Wagon Blast, uh, and he's on the river right side, which is some of the gnarliest waiting you can ever imagine. And this guy is, like, way out there on the big boy way. This is, like, imagine a basalt sidewalk that basically at, at one point it's, like, six feet deep to your right and, like, eight feet deep to your left. And there's little spines that you can end up on that just end. And then the water's moving too fast. You can't go back up river. It's burly, right? But there's tons of steelhead out there. So I see this guy, and I'm like, wow, big boy weight. And uh, I'm getting a little bit closer, and he's like, you know, he's kind of coming into focus. And I can see that he doesn't have a shirt on. Uh, and and I'm, he's getting a little closer. He's like, okay, he's got a baseball hat on. And I'm like, I'm watching him, and he's like, he's got these headphones on, these big, giant headphones. And he's just, you can tell he's just cranking music. And he's just way into it, man. He's just He's just out there in wagon blast, <laughs> listening to music, got the shirt off, and I'm like, Wah! and I'm like, get just close enough, and I realize that the only thing he is wearing is a black speedo, <laughs> and then he just comes around and just frick cranks one, and he's got the rage, and I'm like, yes, that guy is raging. Like, yes. <laughs> so, that was the first time I saw the rage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is fantastic. <laughs> so did you start wearing a Speedo after that? <laughs> no, but I, I called Tim Ray Jeff, uh, who was a distributor for well, at the time. I called him on my way home from the river. I'm like, dude, you're not going to believe what I just saw. <laughs> He's like, you stopped and took a picture. And I'm like, dude, no. Like, I'm not taking pictures of dudes wearing Speedos. Like, that's They'd put that, awkward. no one Echo, uh, yeah, and no one Tim. No one Ray Jeff, on the... they'd put that on their website, bro. <laughs> Oh, 100%. Boom. 100%. Just that fast. <laughs> That's how you sell a fly line right That's there. Right. That's <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. We got a question from Josh R. Uh, how long was the tube on that reverse marabou? So this started off as this is just uh, the micro tube. Right. And those they start off about maybe in I'm going to guess an inch and a quarter um, here. Let me pop this out of the uh, package. And so when I tied that one, 
you know, I, they have that little nipple. Can you see that in that camera? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So basically we just, from this point where that nipple is, we just cut that right off right there. So we ended up with just about an inch. That's kind of what you start with. Cool. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we also have a question from Reed Anderson, uh, who's asking about uh, short gadgets. Uh, you know, he does mention OPST. Um, there's some other great companies out there doing really short gadget heads, but he's asking uh, if you've used them and what's your experience and what's your opinion. Yeah. So uh, the, one of the lines that I designed is the uh, the Skagit Scout, um, and Prior to the Skagit Scout, we had come out with a line called the Skagit Switch, uh, which was just a little bit longer in some of the smaller sizes. It's almost identical once you get to about 480 grains, so about 20, 20 and a half feet, something like that. Um, so, yeah, I started fishing those on 13-foot rods um, really early. I mean, at that time, we had the, the Skagit Compact, which was roughly 25, 26 feet, but... What I realized really quickly was um, that, you know, so many of the places that we fish just in general don't have a lot of backcasting room. But, you know, what's happened over the years, I mean, you know, when I first moved out to uh, to Oregon to guide on the Deschutes, um, I, I moved specifically to because of spay fishing. I was really trying to make it work in the Midwest. And unfortunately, just, you know, I had some customers, but I, I really wanted to do it full time. Right. And so back then, that would have been in like the early 2000s, um, like 2002. Uh, it was literally almost every day I had to have the conversation with customers like, hey, have you tried spay fishing? And, you know, I, I worked for John and Amy Hazel, who were some of the big pioneers, uh, John especially, uh, in two-handed fishing. And so it was kind of our thing. Uh, so uh, then, I mean, it was pretty common to see mostly single-hand people and then a few two-handed people. And with, I would say within about five or six years, everyone started fishing two-handed rods. And then the, the lines got better and the rods got better. And so, I mean, back in the 2000s, like there just wasn't many people actually catching very many winter steelhead because you had to be a ripping good caster to be able to cast the tips of, of the time and, you know, the flies of the time. So what has happened through this transition of tackle becoming making things more more accessible right so just to give you reference like we were fishing wind cutters and delta spays that were 55 feet long and and then you know you'd have a sink tip on that and everything and now we're coming out with these skagit heads well everybody's getting better and now there's all these commercially tied flies and people are getting better at fly tying and there's more information so it gets a lot harder to you know like just walk into the the really common well-known runs because uh, you might get one two or three in the morning that hasn't been fished and then by midday like it's been fished and it's been fished with somebody who probably has the right flies the right fly line everything else so what i found myself doing is fishing a lot of water that other people just simply don't want to fish because the waiting is too tough the trees are overhanging too much it's just it's freaking combat fishing right and so those short heads are uh, just awesome for that kind of water, right? Even on a little bit longer rod, like a you know, 12 and a half, 13 foot rod. Uh, just because the, the less line that you, you know, the shorter the line becomes, right? The thicker it has to become to get the amount of weight that you need to bend the rod. And so you, you're kind of exchanging, you know, when you make a spade cast, there's like a number of forces at work. You've got the speed of the line, the mass of the line, and the tension of the line on the water. Those are all helping you bend the rod, right? So as you as you move down in your the length of your head, you're using less speed and more mass, right? So it allows you to make such a shallow little D loop, but now you've got you've got enough mass that you can still make a cast. And, and believe it or not, I, I would say that most people overcast runs. Um, and that's one of the downsides of a shorter head is it, it loses stability, right? It doesn't, if you have a 55 foot head, it's going to want to carry the loop a long time, but it's not going to turn over anything. Uh, the shorter heads, the shorter it goes, the less flight time you're going to get, right? But honestly, most of our fish out here are caught 40 feet from the bank. 
it, this perception that you have to cast super, super far oftentimes actually hurts people. And that's a whole nother discussion of why that's bad. But um, so I'm willing to compromise a little bit of distance to make up for the ability to fish that tight stuff. That makes sense. It was a that, really long answer, but I like that. makes no, sense to me. Good, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've loved those shorter heads for single hand rods, for some of the really short spays, like what Loomis is doing, what some of the other companies out there are doing that, that fit our waters really well. You know, Absolutely. Um, yeah. We had a gr uh, fun comment from uh, Terry Tatterchuck. Uh, reminds uh, him of a breakfast I, at the Wellston Inn. <laughs> 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 uh, he said, uh, tell us about skating for steelhead. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, our, this is, I think, one big difference between our fish and maybe some of the Great Lakes fish. Um, and it depends on the river that you go to, right? Like, the, the summer rivers in, in the Columbia Basin are all really good dry fly rivers. Um, some are better than others. Um, you know, the Grand Ron is kind of a notorious skater river. <clears throat> the Deschutes is really good. The North Umpqua is amazing. Um, but, you know, I, I would tell you that, um, I don't know, well, this summer I, I, I didn't fish a wet fly. I only fished skaters this year. And um, wow. Wow. I really dedication. got into it the popping flies um you know scott howell really popularized the scopper um which was kind of building on what some of the older guides on the the, the columbia or i'm sorry the north umqua did where they twitched muddlers and what scott figured out was you can really pound on a fly uh so so yeah i mean i've I, i've really kind of gotten into that style of fishing and admittedly like i was kind of late to the dance on it a, a number of my friends jason kirchy who's an amazing steelheader, uh, showed me a bunch of stuff. Um, but figuring out how to kind of how to pop flies and how to design flies well for popping, that's been really fun. And it, it's opened up a lot of water because the popping thing, um, it, it works in certain types of water really well. And you've kind of got to adjust how hard you pop and what your fly is doing. But uh, especially in like big, deep, royally, ledgy stuff, and it, they just freaking annihilate those things it's really really fun so uh you know the funny thing about skater fishing and and i would i'd be willing to bet because i know terry you fish a lot of skaters uh yourself back in the the midwest but um i i saw this all the time uh when i was guiding you know like i would go hey man do you want to fish a skater and uh the guy you know inevitably the guy would say like well you know let, let's get one first and then we'll maybe we'll try it so then he gets one. I'm like, hey, you want to fish a skater? And he goes, well, this is working. So, <laughs> so uh, one, thing, one thing that I, I do a lot of times when people don't have that confidence, and I will tell you that, like, there's times of the year for us, especially uh, that kind of mid-October time frame when there's a lot of October cats around, sometimes a skater is going to outfish a wet fly. Um, but what I would do a lot of times is I call it the automatic comeback rig. So... I would have a, a skater on as my point fly. So it's going to be seen by the fish first. And then maybe three feet up the leader, I would drop, a, you know, a, a tag off of a blood knot or a surgeon's knot and then tie on a little comeback wet, something smaller and buggier and darker. Right. And so in historically, the way people, when they rig two flies, they would put the wet fly as their point fly and then their skater further up down uh, up the line. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that was because it cast better. But the problem with it is, like, when you raise a steelhead, whether it's to a skater or to a wet fly, the first thing you do is put on a smaller wet fly, right? So you don't want to show them the small wet fly first, right? Show them the skater. Give them a chance to freaking eat on top. And, and then what's cool about it is you step down, and now they get the wet. And the thing to realize, and, and this is really kind of dry line fishing specific because I don't know with sink tips, but when you're fishing dry lines, my in my estimates, for every fish that you feel or that you see and that they boil on the fly, you had another three or four fish come to the fly that you had no idea even came up and looked at it. No clue. Uh, they just didn't, they didn't boil high enough in the water column to create a disturbance or it was such a subtle disturbance. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's literally like, why did that wave move laterally and not 
you know, horizontally. Uh, and you, you really get zoned in on where you think your fly is. But uh, for most people, especially when you're, you know, when you're fishing, you're kind of low. Oftentimes I would be on the bank watching the fly swing and I could actually see the fish come up and, and swipe at it. So what's cool about that rig, and you can do it with a wet fly as well, like a, you know, an attractor wet, like a green butt skunk or whatever is your point fly and then a small little comeback fly in front of it. Uh, it, it really puts a lot of fish on the, on the beach. It's a, it's a great way to fish. So if you, if you want to try skater fishing, but you don't have the confidence, try that rig. Cause then you're, you're doubling down you still get all the visual and all of that stuff. Um, it's, it's really fun though. Pitts, have you got one on a dry before? No, I've hooked two on a dry. One of them was in the Matt, upper boat. Matt. Oh, right on. Matt, how about you? No. No. Well, I think those Michigan fisheries are tough because they're they're so deep. Those, I mean, there's spots where those fish sit that that are not deep. But um, I think I, those I'd be willing some, to bet some, that um, I think some are on. Yeah. I think our I summer say run. The exact if you same really thing. if you really yeah. put your time in on the summer run, you could do that. I was going to say the yeah. exact same thing. Yeah. You know that September time period even july know, and august like yeah. you get those summer runs like if you're in the right spot right spot yeah, where they're the creeks, so aggressive the, the springs I've, I've you know i've got them on you know stripping a zoo cougar style fly you know just you know just on the surface right. yep they almost scary when they take pretty soon we're gonna have them in brown, the board so. that we can catch them like that <laughs> <laughs> oh here come the comments <laughs> but anyway <laughs> oh, oh no so yeah it's coming tom we really appreciate you tuning in with us tonight and, and doing yeah, this with us this is really cool uh, it, it's super cool man matt was on cloud yeah, Nine, yeah. i must say this morning it's he was so like good. hey we got tom it's like the fanciest <laughs> northern angler shirt yeah. i own I he's like he got it. all dressed <laughs> up you <laughs> know extra beard oil right. I mean, oh yeah i mean <laughs> yeah well thank you to uh to everybody that tight that tuned in live really appreciate you guys spending the time with us and uh yeah hopefully hopefully you guys are a little inspired and learn some stuff and uh yeah have a great have a great spring i'm sure your steelhead fishing is rolling by now so uh well we need some rain rain. we didn't get it today we did not get the rain we needed today so over half an inch was predicted and we got bupkis oh i mean hubbard says hi tom Oh, Jeff Hubbard's in the house yeah. too, man. Oh, right. Might yeah. have to talk yeah. to Jeff if, about. If, if you're looking for a guide on the PM to swing, Jeff. He is, is the man. man. That's the guy he right is there. The man. You can see it right there. Yeah, maybe we could rope him into doing one of these. Yeah. Anyway, thanks, thanks, Tom. He's we appreciate not, it, buddy. I, his thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. I, I will tell you, like Hubbard's tying is awesome, and it, and there's certainly some of Jeff's. Uh, you know, influence in some of my, my patterns. So sure. Sure. He's he, I like his joker. He's got some great stuff. He d- he's done some yeah, stuff the with, heckler's past, good the heckler. with yeah. rubber legs. All right, Tom, stay with us. We're going to hop over to our full screen real quick. And, uh, thank you everyone for hey, tuning thanks, in everyone. tonight. Uh, Super if you fun. haven't done so, Think about subscribing. We got a few more nights coming up. We're going to go through this month. And something else is happening today, which Uh-oh. is pretty cool. Uh, fly, fly Fishing, fishing film, film Tour is live. So if you're not ready to go to bed yet, uh, you can go to our website and check out events and fly, sh- fly Fishing Film Tour and buy discounted tickets. Or you can come into the shop. Today is the first day. It's worth checking out. Uh, get ready for screening for spring get pumped up and uh yeah, so awesome. i got we got a lot of stuff coming down the pipe we're just trying to check in all the new gear every day we are There's overwhelmed right now so thanks, uh, for thanks everyone support, for the everyone. business we really appreciate you shopping small and we will catch you next week catch you next week thanks everybody